time is it? What day is it? Oh, oh wait. We're supposed to be talking about Revelation. The sleeping church. Get it? The sleeping church? The church that gets a wake-up call from Jesus? That's what we're talking about today. So, listen, Grace Point, if you're out there, wake up! Wake up, because we're going to be talking about the church in Sardis, which was the sleeping church. Now, be honest. How many of you have ever fallen asleep in church like I just did? Well, not exactly like I just did, but how many of you have fallen asleep in church? I know that when I... When I was growing up, I used to fall asleep in church quite a bit. In fact, I got a picture here of uh, me and my brothers as we are uh, getting ready to go to church. And uh, you can see how uh, fashionable I was even back then. I uh, wore this shirt today to kind of keep in, in the same color scheme as I was then. But I remember when I was sitting in church, my mother would always make um, me and, and my three brothers, we would always have to sit in the same pew with her. And I would always try to sit as far away from her as I could, uh, not because I didn't like my mom, but I just wanted to be out of arm's reach from her. And so uh, I, there would be times where I would fall asleep. And here's the weirdest thing. Most kids, when they fall asleep, they get an elbow or they get a nudge or a tap or they get, shh, wake up, wake up, like that. Not me. When I nodded off, I could feel my mother's eyes staring at me. Like I could just feel her looking at me. And I would be fast asleep and I would just go, and I'd look over at her, and sure enough, she was staring right at me. She, that woman could stare me awake in church. Of course, as I got older, how I dealt with sleeping in church was a little bit different, uh, especially when I had kids. I remember there would be a couple of times where I would just nod off in church, and I'd just be sitting in church like this, and I'd wake up, and I'd still be here, and I'd realize that I had been sleeping. And so what I'd do is I'd just start mouthing some things with my mouth, and I'd say softly, amen. And I'd open my eyes and wake up and hope that people would think that I was asleep. Well, uh, we are in episode five of our series, Seven, the Seven Churches of Revelation. And we're looking at seven letters that Jesus wrote to seven churches in, um, in uh, Asia Minor, these seven churches uh, that the resurrected Jesus had something to say to these churches. Now, if you look, we've been talking about this, how the order of these churches followed the ancient Roman mail route, started in Ephesus, went to Pergamum, uh, Thyatira, and then came back around here to Sardis, which was the sleeping church. And we started this series with that first church, Ephesus, and Ephesus was the, the church that lost its first love. And then we kind of circled up and went to the church in Pergamum, and, and the church in Pergamum was the church that, was, that, that compromised, that began to compromise with the world. We, last week we talked about the church in Thyatira, the church that tolerated sin inside the church. Until finally we come to today, we come to the, to the church in Sardis, the church that Jesus says, hey... Wake up. It's time for you guys to wake up. Jesus is talking to sleepy Christians. In fact, he's, they're so sleepy, he says, wake up to them twice. And so Jesus dictates this letter. He dictates it to uh, one of his followers, a, a man named John, one of his disciples who had been exiled to the island of Patmos. And Jesus comes to him and says, write these letters. And so listen, this is what Jesus says to the, to the church in Sardis. He says to John, write this letter to the messenger of the church in Sardis. This is the message from the one who has the sevenfold spirit of God and the seven stars. And Jesus says to the church in Sardis, I know all the things you do. You have, and that you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. And he says, wake up, wake up. So who is this uh, church in Sardis? Who are these people? Well, Sardis was the capital of the kingdom of Lydia. And uh, Sardis was a, an important city. It was a military city. Uh, we've got some pictures here of what Sardis looks like today. Uh, Sardis was a wealthy city. It was a prosperous city. It was an affluent city. In fact, this is a picture, an aerial view of their gym, right? It's their YMCA. That was the wrong order. 
not the song, right? But it was their gymnasium. It was built on six acres. We got some pictures of some of the ruins left on the outside. It was a place for, where young men went to study. They studied philosophy and they studied medicine and they studied the arts. Um, the people in Sardis were, were also ed educated and they were wealthy. And they were wealthy partly because um, they mined precious metals in Sardis. They would mine precious metals there. Gold and silver was mined in Sardis. In, in fact, Sardis was the very first city in history to mint gold and silver coins um, for use in, in transactions. The first coins ever used in gold and silver were made in Sardis. In fact, we've got a picture here of, of a coin from Sardis that was minted out of gold. Now, Sardis was interesting because it was built on a mountain. It was on the top of a mountain, about 1,500 feet from the city to the valley below it. And Sardis was considered impregnable. I mean, take a look at these pictures of the mount, side of the mountains at Sardis. In fact, it's in, in its entire history, Sardis had only been taken over twice, once by the Persians and once by the Greeks. In fact, there's this interesting story where uh, there was a soldier from Sardis who was walking around and, and his helmet accidentally dropped and went down the side of the hill. And so the soldier that night went down the hill in order to uh, retrieve his helmet and he took the secret pathway that only the people in Sardis knew about. Well, one of his enemies, uh, one of the Greek soldiers, saw him come down. And so the next day they took a, a, a bunch of soldiers, and at night they went up the same pathway that the soldier from Sardis had come down, and when they got to the top of the mountain, when they got to the front gates of the city, you know what they found? There was nobody there. They had no guards at all at the front of the city, at the gate of the city. There was no one guarding the city. Everybody was inside, and everybody was asleep because they were so comfortable, and they were so secure, and they thought that they were so safe but they were all asleep. And so God is kind of, um, uh, you know, it's funny how he does this, right? He says, I know who you guys are. And Jesus writes this letter and he's saying, I know who you are. You've got those guys that every time you have seen ruin in your life, it's because you were asleep. Sardis was a city that was full of sleepy Christians, a city that was full of spiritual sleepwalkers. And Jesus is looking at them and they're saying, he's saying, you guys are so fast asleep that you are practically dead. Which is in contrast to the reputation that the city of Sardis had. The city of Sardis was known to be full of energy and vitality. It was known to be a thriving city. I mean, if we, we talked about this last week, that if Ephesus was like Los Angeles, it was the largest metropolitan area, it was on the water, there was a lot of trade, it was very multicultural. And if Pergamum was like San Francisco, it was also on the water, but it was the hip city, it was the place where everybody wanted to live. And then we said Thyatira was like South San Francisco, South City, uh, here where we are. Um, for those of you who don't know, South City is the city just south of San Francisco, and in South City, not today anymore, but many years ago, from its very beginning, South City was known for its trade, for its factories, and for its workers. In fact, there's a big sign on the hill that's called Sign Hill that says the industrial city because that's what South San Francisco was about. It was just like Thyatira. And so if we look at Sardis, we would look at Sardis being like Palo Alto, uh, the Silicon Valley. Uh, it was wealthy. It was affluent. Uh, it was uh, full of rich people and full of, uh, uh, of, um, of comfortable people. Uh, if you went to Sardis, you would see them all there. They would be all walking around with Patagonia jackets and, and Lululemon pants and uh, yoga pants. And they would, they would, th this is who Sardis was. And the church in Sardis was rich. The church in Sardis was prosperous. The church in Sardis was known for its spiritual vitality. And at one time, it was that. At one time, it was rich in its faith. At one time, it was full of life and it was full of energy. But somewhere along the line, the church in Sardis became complacent and they became arrogant. 
And their faith that was once so alive is now so lifeless, it appears as if it's dead. The church had a reputation for being alive, but in reality, the church was dead. And so what do you do when your reputation no longer reflects your reality? What do you do when there is a gap between what you're known for and who you actually are? I mean, have you ever been to a restaurant that had a great reputation and slowly over time it just started to change? There was this really great restaurant, a little Chinese restaurant in the city that I grew up in, uh, which is just the next city over from here in Daly City. And uh, this was a, a little tiny, you know, hole-in-the-wall restaurant. It probably had maybe 15, 20 seats. It, it was back in the time before a little tiny hole-in-the-wall restaurant was fashionable. And uh, this place just had, like, the best... Um, quick, I'm hungry, satisfy me Chinese food that I have ever had. Uh, it was so good. And, and the, the people there were friendly. The owners were friendly. Um, the, the staff there was friendly. And the food was absolutely amazing. And so growing up, this would be like a treat for us to be able to go to this little cafe and, uh, and, and enjoy some really, really good, simple, hot, but delicious Chinese food. Well, in the mid-90s, we moved to Central Florida, and so, of course, we had to leave the little cafe behind. And every few years, we would come back. And, and, and we would tell all of our friends in Florida about how great this little cafe was. And we'd come back, and we'd go, and we'd eat there again. And, and over time, it kind of changed. Until finally, when we moved back here to the Bay Area, we went to visit it, and it was completely different. Same sign on the outside, same, same um, menu, same kind of vibe, but it was different. The food was different. The people were different. The old restaurant that I loved was dead. It looked like it was alive, but it was dead. Now, this is sad when it happens with a restaurant, but it's absolutely tragic when it happens with a church. Because the worst possible thing that you can say about a church is that it is a dead church. And you know, a church can be full of movement and still be dead. And, and this is so wrong because a church by its nature is supposed to be alive. God lives in the church. Jesus lives in the church. The Spirit lives in the church. It's where we're supposed to find the God is in the church. And Jesus is saying, hey, listen, you, you Christians in Sardis, you need to wake up. You need to wake up. Right? You're lifeless. You're like a corpse. You are, are so asleep that you are practically dead. It's time for a funeral. And it's so hard to figure out how this happens. How does this happen to a church? You know, when I was growing up, there was a church in San Francisco that I would go to once in a while. Some of my friends went to that church. It was a big church, a huge church, right in the city. And it, and it was beautiful. Um, and it was big. Hundreds of people that went there every weekend. It was a very, very nice church. But I remember um, coming back here to the Bay Area. This is probably 20, 30 years after I had grown up there. And going to visit that church. And when we went inside, there was only about a dozen people who were there. It used to have hundreds of people. It used to be alive and thriving. How does a church that once was so alive, so on mission for Jesus lose momentum and start to decline. You know, maybe you, you have a building somewhere where you live that you drive by. It kind of looks like a church. Maybe it used to be a church. You don't know if there's a church there now. What happened to it? And Jesus is saying, listen, you guys in Sardis, you have a reputation for being alive, but in reality, you're dead. That's what he's saying. And he's talking to the church in Sardis, but he could very well be talking to the church in the United States today. The statistics on the church today are not good. In 2014, there were 3,700 churches that closed, but 4,000 churches that opened, a net gain of 300 churches. Fast forward five years, in 2019, there were only 3,000 churches that opened, but 4,500 churches that closed, a net loss of 1,500 churches. 
Today, this week, over a hundred churches will permanently shut their doors here in the United States. 80% of all churches are either plateauing or declining. And attendance at churches, even without COVID and the pandemic, has been on a decline. 20 years ago, the average attendance of a church, average attendance of a church was 150. Today, the average attendance at a church is 64. It's not just churches that are closing. Entire denominations are closing their doors. Many of them because they let go of biblical truth and they embraced social causes. They, they started to take political positions. And as they started to press into the world, they began to drift farther away from Jesus. And so when we look at the church in the United States, it's like looking at the church in Sardis. As has a reputation for being alive, but in reality, it's dead. And Lord, please, I pray that we never experience that here at Grace Point. That we would never grow complacent. That we would never settle for normal, because normal is the 80%. See, that's not us, praise God, but that could easily be us. It's so easily to fall into that, to drift into that. And that's why it's so important for us to listen to what Jesus is saying. He says, this is the message from the one who has the sevenfold spirit of God and the seven stars. Now, what does that mean, sevenfold spirit of God? In fact, if you've been following along in your Bibles with us, you might have read the seven spirits of God. And how can that be? I thought there was only one Holy Spirit, right? So how can there, you know, what does Jesus mean when he says that? Seven spirits, the sevenfold spirit of God. Well, when there's something that we don't understand in scriptures, oftentimes what we will do is we will look to other scriptures to explain it or to interpret it. So we've been talking about the number seven as being symbolic. It symbolizes completion. It symbolizes perfection. But the sevenfold spirit of of, of God, we actually can look back to one of the books that was written in what we call the Old Testament, the part of the scriptures that were written before Jesus. And when we look in, in uh, the book of Isaiah, we read what the prophet writes. And listen to what he says, because he's going to count off the seven spirits. He says, and the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. It has, it's one Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit has seven aspects. It has seven facets, seven characteristics, seven different ministries of the Spirit. The Lord, wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and fear of the Lord. And Jesus is saying, I am the one holding all of that. I'm holding the fullness of the Holy Spirit. I am the one that sends you the Holy Spirit. In fact, Jesus said before he left the earth, he said, I have to go so that the Holy Spirit can come. Jesus says, I am the one that fills my church with the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And the fullness of the Holy Spirit is the only thing that any church ever needs. The only thing that a church needs. And Jesus is talking to this church that he's basically saying, the Spirit has left the building. The Holy Spirit is not in you. He says, I know all the things you do and that you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. And he says, wake up. This is your wake up call. He says, you have a reputation for being alive, but you're dead. So wake up because the Spirit has left the building. May that never happen to us. You know, one of the exciting things about this series has been that so many people have said to me that they have felt, they've heard, they've experienced the Holy Spirit in these seven letters that we, uh, so in the five letters that we have been looking at uh, so far of these letters that Jesus sent to these seven churches. Some of you have told me about it. You've told me that you felt like the Holy Spirit was speaking to you while we've been talking about these letters. And one of the things that is common among all of the people who've talked to me is, is that, that you've said that you felt convicted, but not condemned. And that's how we know that it's the Holy Spirit. Jesus says in his word that he didn't come to condemn us, right? There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Condemnation, guilt, shame that does not come from Jesus. 
And when you have the Spirit of the Lord in you, that's what you feel. You feel convicted, but you don't feel condemned. When you have the Spirit of the Lord in you, you accept everyone, but you don't have to approve of everything that they do. That's us here at Grace Point. We accept everyone. No matter what you're doing, no matter what you've done in the past, no matter what you're going to do in the future, no matter what you might believe right now, everyone here is loved and welcomed and accepted. But we don't approve of everything everybody does. God doesn't approve of everything that I do. God doesn't approve of everything that you do. God doesn't approve of everything that anyone does. We're all in the same boat. But God calls us to accept everyone, to love everyone, to welcome everyone. See, when we allow the light of God's Spirit to shine into the dark places of our heart, it, it, it doesn't bring us guilt. It brings us peace. And how we know that the Spirit is in us is when we don't rely on what we can do on our own, but we rely on the power and the strength of the Holy Spirit. A Spirit-filled church does not rely on what it can do on its own. It doesn't rely on the abilities of the people who are in that church. It relies on the Holy Spirit. It relies on the Holy Spirit for its success. Because one of the things that we have seen over and over again is that when any one or any church tries to start making things happen on their own, to try to do things without the Holy Spirit, eventually they're going to compromise in order to get it done. Eventually they're going to cut corners in order to make it happen. And when that happens, you start operating on the world's level. You start operating the way culture operates. And because you're trying to do it on your own, Jesus says, hey, listen, man, wake up. He says, strengthen what little remains, for even what is left is almost dead. Right? Jesus is saying, look, it's not too late, but you're almost dead. Remember that scene from The Princess Bride where Billy Crystal kind of puts his ear to the lips of the guy and, 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 and he says, uh, your friend's not dead. He's just mostly dead. Great scene, great movie. But listen, that's what Jesus is saying about the church in Sardis. He's saying, you guys are mostly dead. Do you know what the antidote is to a spiritless church? It's really, really simple. It's spirit-filled followers of Jesus. Spirit-filled Christians is the solution, the antidote to a spirit-less church. And every single one of us has access to the Holy Spirit. See, a church can be filled with the Holy Spirit simply by being filled with people who are filled with the Holy Spirit. But once we rely on our own, once we think that we can do it on our own, once we start moving forward without trusting in Jesus, that's when we run into problems. He says, I find that your actions do not meet the requirements of my God. See, there are actions. Because here's the thing. A church can be busy doing things and still be dead. A dead church doesn't mean that nothing is going on. A dead church is simply a church that is doing things without the power of the Holy Spirit. There is an evangelist and pastor named Vance Havner, and listen to what he writes talking about the church in Sardis, but could easily ta be talking about the church today. He says, We are not to get the impression that Sardis was a defunct affair with the building a wreck, the members scattered, the pastor ready to resign. It was a busy church with meetings every night, committees galore, wheels within wheels, promotion and publicity, something going on all the time, it had a reputation of being a live, wide-awake, going concern. See, Sardis was a rich church, and because it was a rich church, it was a comfortable church. Because it was an affluent church, it could do a lot on its own, and they began to stop depending on the Holy Spirit's power and started to rely on their own strength. And when a church starts doing that, well, oh man, it's done. It's game over. The church slowly died because the Spirit had left it. Not that the Spirit wasn't present because the Spirit was everywhere. In fact, it might be better to say that the church died not because the Spirit left it, but because the people left 
the Spirit. The Spirit was no longer in the things that the church was doing. How do we know that uh, the Spirit is no longer in the things that the church is doing? When a church stops taking risks. When a church stops stepping out in faith. When a church stops trusting God to do what they can't do. You know, from the very beginning here at Grace Point, in fact, our very first, uh, the first core value is that we act with audacious faith. We don't do anything that we can do on our own. We will only attempt to do things that we know can't be done unless God is in it. We're not going to do it on our own. We have to rely on the Holy Spirit. Jesus goes on and he writes, he says, Go back to what you heard and believed at first. Hold to it firmly. What you heard and believed at first, because there was a time that they had heard about the goodness and the love and the grace of Jesus. And, they, and that was good news to them and they believed it. And Jesus is saying, you remember that? Hold on to that. Hold on to that. Notice he doesn't say, hold on to what you did at first. He doesn't say, no, hold on to how you acted at first. He says, hold on to what you believed at first. What you were thinking at first, the way you thought at first. And then he says, repent and turn to me again. Now, I know for a lot of people, you hear that word, repent. And, you know, that word just, it, it's kind of uncomfortable to hear. It kind of makes you kind of do like this. You're just like, mm, I don't know, repent. It's, it's one of those, you know, religious, condemning, Christian-y words. It's like, yeah, you, you, you hear it from that guy who's, who's downtown at the cable car station with a milk crate turned upside down. He's standing up on it, and he's just yelling at people, and he's saying, repent, repent, repent. You better turn or you're going to burn. Repent. And, and, and unfortunately, our culture has kind of gotten that understanding of that's what that word means. Repent literally simply means to change your mind, change your thinking, change the way you're thinking. Think differently. Repent means to turn in a different direction. In fact, Jesus says that. He says, repent and turn to me again. Just turn. He's saying, you have been so focused on the world. You have kept moving towards the world. And the only thing that you need to do to turn things around is to simply turn towards me. Not clean up your life. Not stop doing all those bad things. Not, not break all of those bad habits. We're going to get to that. But all he's saying is turn to me. Turn. Start thinking differently. Change your mind. Change your thinking. Because here's the thing. When you change your mind, eventually it will change your heart. And when you change your heart, it will eventually change your hands. It will change what your hands are doing. It will change what you do. You'll start living differently. And the problem is, is that for so many people, the call to follow Jesus that they hear is, is that you have to just be a better person, to act in a more moral way. That is the call to Jesus. That when it, what it means to be a follower of Jesus is you've got to clean up your act. You've got to get over those bad habits. And here's the thing that we've seen over and over again that never works. It never works. It doesn't start with a change of actions. It always starts with a change of heart. And we'll make mistakes and we'll fall short. And that's where the grace of God comes in. See, the grace of God is always available, but it only comes to those who know that they need it. It only comes to those who know that they need it. Jesus accepts you. He accepts me just as we are with all of our baggage and all of our guilt and all of our shame, with all of the mistakes of our past, with all of the mistakes we're doing right now, He accepts us just as we are. And all He is asking us to do is to, instead of heading in the direction of the world, to simply turn and move towards Him. All you have to do is change the way you think. Repent is just changing the way that you think. Jesus says, he goes on and he says, if you don't wake up, I will come to you suddenly as, an unexpect, as unexpected as a thief. And here's another nod to the people in Sardis who would read this phrase and have a very specific connotation of knowing that it was in the times where they were asleep at night that the enemies came in and took their city. 
They know what it's like to have someone surprise them at night. And so when Jesus says this, this really hits home for them. He says, yet there are some in the church in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes with evil. Right? This is a contrast to the other cities. When we look at Pergamum, we look at Thyatira, there was a, a few rotten apples, but mostly it was good people. Here in Sardis, there's a few good apples and everyone else is just totally rotten. And then he says, there's some who have not soiled their clothes with evil. And he's talking to them because this is, again, one of those things that they understood. When you go to worship the gods, their gods, the gods of the people in Sardis, when you go to worship the gods, you had to go there with clean clothing. And Jesus is saying, yeah, you've got this clean clothing on, but your clothes aren't soiled with dirt. They're soiled with evil. And then Jesus gives us some good news. He says, man, if you are one of those few whose clothes aren't soiled with evil, he says, they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Now, white is symbolic. It's a symbol for purity. I want you to hold on to that because listen to what he says next. He says, all who are victorious will be clothed in white. Jesus is going to clothe you in white. So we said white is a symbol of purity. And, and you know, the reason that brides wear white at weddings actually comes from the book of Revelation. In chapter 19, it talks about Jesus and the church and, and a bride who is given a robe of white linen, fine white linen, as a symbol of purity to put on to the bride. Now get this. Almost every other religious tradition says, you have got to clean yourself. Jesus says, it's impossible for you to clean yourself, so I'm going to take my robe of purity, my robe of white, my robe that is pure and clean, and I'm going to put it on you. And when you are wearing my robe of white, you are as pure as I am. You are as clean as I am. That no matter how dirty you might feel, when you put that on, you are clean. Not because of anything that you have done, but because you have accepted me, I'm going to put this white linen on you. I'm going to put this purity on you. And so Jesus says, remember that it's not you. It's not your own power. It's not what you can do. Remember that it's me. And if you will just hold on to what you believed, you're going to be able to have my purity on you. Jesus says, I will never erase their names from the book of life, but I will announce before my father and his angels that they are mine. And so he's making a reference here that everyone there would have understood. That he is going to be proud. He is going to be the one walking in ahead of you. And that because you are with him, that you can stand before the Father. And they will know, he will know, that you belong to Jesus. See, that's what Jesus wants. Jesus wants to walk through life with you. Jesus doesn't want you to be scared of him. There's no reason to be scared of him. Jesus wants us to know that he did not come here to condemn us. He came here to cleanse us. He didn't come here to make us feel guilty. He came here to give us peace. And he closes it out. Anyone with ears to hear. That's right. We can say, oh, this was 2,000 years ago. It doesn't apply to us. We're, that's, you know, out there in Asia Minor, in Turkey and that doesn't apply to us. They didn't have the technology that we do. They, don't, they weren't as culturally aware as we are. That doesn't apply to us. No, Jesus is saying, listen, anyone, anyone in, in time, anyone in location, anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what He is saying to the churches. So my friends, listen, what is the Spirit saying to you today? What is the Spirit saying to you today? Is your faith so asleep that it appears dead? Or is your faith alive? I want to have a faith that is alive. I want to have a faith that is filled with the Spirit, a faith that is pure and a faith that is powerful, not because of anything that I've done, not because of anything that I was able to accomplish, but because of what Jesus has already done for you and for me. And if you're a Christian and you want to have a faith 
that's alive, then I want to give you an opportunity. We're going to pray together that God would continue to allow us to have a faith that's alive, that would, that would give us opportunities to make our faith alive, to trust in Him and let our faith grow. But if you are watching us today, if you're here with us today and you are not a Christian, not a follower of Jesus, if you are hesitant, if there's something in your past, maybe you've been to church before and you've gotten burned, maybe you walked away from the church and with it you walked away from God, Maybe there's some hesitancy because you're not sure exactly what it means to be a follower of Jesus, but the, the, the feeling that you get, that, that, that peace that you get from just thinking, is that true? Is it all I have to do is to just repent? All I have to do is to turn, to change the way that I'm thinking, that, that I'm, I, I'm not required to clean up my act or break all the bad habits or, or straighten out my life in order to turn to Jesus, but I can just right now turn to Jesus? Absolutely. And we're going to pray that the Holy Spirit gives you the courage to make that turn. And then that He will give you the power that you need to just start moving slowly in the direction of Jesus. If, if that's you, then let's pray together. Father God, thank you so much for not letting us go. For those who, who have fallen asleep, where it almost appears as if we're lifeless, if everything is dead, then Lord, please wake us up. Wake us up. Let this be a call for us to awaken again. Awaken that faith that we used to have, that the trust in you that we used to have. Holy Spirit, fill us. Fill us. And let us learn again to walk anew in your power and in your strength. And Father God, for those who have not yet made that decision, to turn in your direction, to follow you. I pray, Father, that you would give them the courage to do that. That you would send people along their path that would encourage them and that would grow their faith and that would be good examples of, of how you've changed their lives. Lord, I pray that you would give them the, the, the mind of Christ, give them the mindset to be able to just say, I want to, to give up on trying to do it all on my own and I want the peace of knowing that I am moving in the direction of Jesus. Lord, for those who want to make that decision now, I pray, Father God, that you would give a special blessing to them. A blessing of encouragement and a blessing of hope. Thank you for allowing us to be able to read these letters that you wrote to those churches that you write to us. We pray all of this together in Jesus' name.